In today's video, we're gonna do a quick Shein update since they've been very busy recently. We're gonna check up on Fashion Week and the campaign there that was turning quite a lot of heads. And we're gonna cover some other updates from well-known brands like H&M, Nike, Primark, and also go into a good news section. There's a lot to cover like always, so let's get into it. Before we begin, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. If you are new here, hi, my name is Katie. I do fashion news roundup videos just like this one quite regularly on my channel. So if it sounds interesting to you and you enjoy this video, then make sure to subscribe and like, and let's get into the news. Like I just said, Shein has been really busy recently. They've just released their sustainability report for 2023 and it had quite a big fallout. You might recognize this graph that Business of Fashion created a few years ago showing how Shein's volume production far outpaces a lot of its rivals in the fashion industry. Well, now we have new charts that show that Shein is one of the worst polluters in the fashion industry right now. These charts help visualize exactly how much Shein is polluting and where that pollution is coming from. It also shows how that pollution compares to other names in the fashion industry, but also how it compares to Shein's previous years and the growth of emissions, which is really quite staggering. The ultra fast fashion giant's emissions have nearly tripled in the past three years as its growth far outpaces other major brands. For the first time, it's shown to be a higher polluter than Zara. Although it's important to note that companies have different ways of measuring their emissions, so this is just an estimate, but it's an educated estimate. Obviously, seeing these statistics, while it is eye-opening, isn't that interesting in itself. So let's talk about why it's so important. Well, Shein is on a PR crusade right now. As I said in my video, they're trying to list on the London Stock Exchange and they're trying to reform their image in order to do it. They're also trying to expand into Europe and grab that European market at a time when the EU is really cracking down on sustainability and trying to introduce a lot of new ESG laws that don't work with Shein's current business model. The company is really trying to market themselves as caring about sustainability, both for the reasons I've just mentioned, but also in order to market to that eco-conscious consumer that is growing in Europe. And one of the ways they love to paint themselves as sustainable is shoving their practically made to order, as they like to say, business model down our throats any chance they can get. In fact, their recent 2023 report had a whole page very close to the beginning talking all about this. But these new emission calculations from from Shein's own report and helpfully visualized by BOF show that that impact is not being mitigated by their business model. The sheer volume of clothes produced by Shein is unfathomable and Shein do not want to take responsibility for this overproduction. In fact, they try to shirk responsibility for these increased emissions by blaming it on factors outside of their control, like supply chains. But brands should not be able to get away with not taking responsibility for their supply chains. And this kind of relates to a story we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But first, let's do some other really quick Shein updates. First is that Shein is planning on hosting live streams this week. And I spoke a little bit about this on my recent podcast episode which is also available on YouTube. They're planning to release five collections at once and tie it into a live shopping experience where consumers can purchase stuff in real time as they see it on the live stream. And if you don't know why this is an issue definitely go check my live stream shopping video where I break down exactly why this is an issue. Also this week the Biden-Harris administration announced plans to crack down on the tax loophole that ultra fast fashion brands like Shein, like Temu, currently operate on and abuse to reduce their tax import costs. Basically what you need to know is that a lot of countries have a de minimis, I hope I'm saying that right, a de minimis tax hole loop where if a package comes under a certain value amount, brands have to pay less tax on it. And Shein and Temu's business models directly take advantage of this and it's why packages ordered by customers from Shein and Temu are shipped directly from China versus the way that a lot of other companies do it where they ship a whole massive barrel of packages over to their warehouse in the US and then distribute it from there. All this to say the Biden-Harris administration is hoping to crack down on that and it will definitely impact Shein and Temu. 
Okay, circling back to those business of fashion graphs real quick, you might notice that the third biggest polluter on there is Nike, who we're gonna be talking about next. So the big four fashion weeks are ongoing. If you follow me on Instagram, you might've seen that I actually attended London Fashion Week and I spoke a little bit about this on my podcast, but I'm planning on doing a special video talking about the sustainability present at all four fashion weeks once it's over. So make sure you're subscribed in order to see that when it comes out. But I wanted to mention this specific specific campaign going on in New York Fashion Week. If you care about sustainable fashion, you probably follow Venetia Lamana on some form of social media. She's definitely one to follow if you don't. But today we're talking about her coverage of New York Fashion Week, which was definitely less about the shows and more about following a clothing waste zombie through the streets of Times Square. The clothing waste zombie is part of the All Foundations new campaign asking brands to speak volumes basically publish how many clothes they're making every year, since this is definitely something that is not happening in the industry right now and should be. Part of Venetia and the All Foundation social media coverage was calling out Nike as the American brand most commonly found on the beaches of the global South, thanks to the waste colonialism trade. Real quick, you can get involved with this campaign and ask brands like Nike to speak volumes just by tagging them on social media or doing some other really simple things that I'm going to link in the description of this video because it's absolutely criminal that we don't know how many clothes brands are making. Nike, Shein, Zara, we're always just guessing their production volumes and without access to this information we can't hold brands accountable. Let's cover some other Nike news because like Shein the company has not had a great month at least in terms of sustainability. Circling back to my coverage of the Olympics and the unethical fashion brands that are allowed to sponsor the most sustainable games yet. Nike was apparently the biggest winner when it came to turning those eyeballs on its brand into sales. Reuters called Nike's campaign a gold rush and it was reported that 2 million people visited the site during the Olympics and almost 90,000 of those visits converted into a sale. Definitely go watch my Olympic sustainability special video if you're interested in why this is such an issue and also why LVMH will not be happy with the fact that Nike was the overall winner. Also in Nike news, the PR disaster that just won't die. I keep coming back to this story because it keeps getting worse. If you're new to my channel and now it turns out that they're hiring interns to fill those roles. Experts I follow in the industry were talking about how underhand this tactic is. I was only able to find one sustainability internship role on their website, but the requirements for it were insane. They were asking for two years experience of sustainability work. And as was pointed out in the comments of the LinkedIn post where I originally saw this, it's clear that the company is asking these interns to deliver very tangible, very lofty goals. And I'm not saying that this is out of the blue in terms of offering an internship in sustainability where you have to achieve results, but it is coming at a very suspicious time when Nike has obviously just cut a lot of sustainability staff when they still have a lot of sustainability goals to reach. In my opinion, it's very, very suspicious. And finally, before we move on to another company, Nike recently had their annual shareholder meeting and I haven't been this invested in boardroom drama since I watched Succession last year. There was a lot of anticipation leading up to the event that happened last week because shareholders were voting on proposals that directly concern the sustainability of Nike, including one which called for Nike to address human rights issues like wage theft and forced labor in their supply chain, which the shareholders voted against. One of the things that was approved, however, was the CEO's $30 million compensation package for 2024, which in my my opinion just shows you exactly where Nike's priorities lie. Okay, we're finally done with Nike. On to a new report which links fast fashion's waste colonialism trade to an environmental and public health disaster in Ghana. Now, this report isn't really telling us anything new. 
We already know that the waste colonialism trade going into the global south to countries like Ghana is a massive, massive issue. What the report does confirm is that nearly half of all of that clothing going to Ghana is poor quality, i.e. made from synthetic fibers like polyester, like nylon, like acrylic, and they have no resale value. We also knew that the clothes that started in the markets were often ending up in landfills, but this research has also confirmed that those landfills are causing environmental and public health issues by contaminating the soil, the water, the food cycle and air of the surrounding area. This research also highlighted the fact that some of these clothes, instead of going to landfill, are being diverted to public wash houses and used as fuel to boil the water for the baths. Air samples collected by Greenpeace showed the surrounding air of these public wash houses were filled with harmful chemicals, much higher than government warn is acceptable. And it showed that the workers, the people visiting the public houses and the people living nearby are all at risk of the public health issues caused by this air pollution. Like I said, we've known about a lot of these issues for years, but hopefully this recent report Report from Greenpeace will serve as a more public pressure and another reminder to brands that they are directly responsible for what is happening there. Like we said, a lot of the clothing ending up in Ghana is fast fashion. It's not fit for reselling. And that kind of brings me on to our next story. I was tempted to put this one in the good news section, but you'll see why I haven't when I finish. Primark are now hosting swap shops for customers to exchange their pre-owned and vintage items in store. This is gonna be a campaign across the UK. And obviously the brand is providing a space for customers to give a new lease of life to their clothes, which is a good thing. The company has stated that any unswapped clothes will be kept for a new swap event or donated to local charities in the area or placed in Primark's textile donation boxes. And there's a couple of things I wanna go over there. One is the idea that some of these clothes will end up in local charity stores. We already know charity stores are inundated with poor quality fast fashion that often gets shipped back into the waste colonialism trade. So I worry that that might happen here. And secondly, this is obviously quite Quite good PR for Primark, especially since they've partnered with quite a good clothing recycling scheme here in the UK, which does seem to be diverting clothes from landfill rather than just saying they are. But Primark still isn't addressing their overproduction. And like I said, when covering the All Foundations new campaign, we don't know how many clothes Primark creates but we know it's a lot. So whilst they're getting good PR for this, they're not addressing their overproduction, which is the root of the issue. And you also have to ask yourself, is Primark clothing fit for rewearing? Like we just saw in the last story, a lot of the clothing that ends up in the waste colonialism trade isn't fit for repurposing. And Primark clothing is fast fashion. It's often made from polyester and plastic based materials. And it's often designed to be worn only once. You have to think the people that are participating in this event most likely are Primark customers, which is why they're in the store in the first place. So they're gonna be bringing along Primark clothing to be resold. But do people want to rewear old Primark clothing that's already falling apart from the first user. I don't think so. I don't think a lot of this clothing is going to be resold. So in my opinion, this scheme isn't really good. It's just good PR. Mm, speaking of, H&M have just launched five new pre-loved sections in stores across the world. And what's interesting, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that at least in some of these stores, they seem to be stocking pre-loved H&M or stuff from H&M's other brands, rather than what was happening in the London store that I reported on in a video a while back. In that video, I explained how H&M had partnered with a vintage wholesaler who was providing them clothing that wasn't directly donated by H&M's textile recycling scheme in store, which seemed like a massive missed opportunity and also didn't really Really fit with the vibe of what people were looking for when they came into H&M. But I saw a LinkedIn post from someone who was in their Stockholm store, which seemed to confirm that H&M pre-loved pieces were on display to be bought, which is nice to see them addressing a criticism. But they're also still one of the biggest polluters in the industry, as we saw from those business of fashion graphs, and we still don't know how many clothes they create. So again, this feels 
like a typical green washing campaign where they're addressing something much, much easier than their clothing production. Let's do an update on the Bangladesh situation, which I've been following here on my channel. If you don't know, Bangladesh has been going through a really rough time recently of political unrest, and that's been directly impacting their fashion industry, which the Bangladesh economy heavily relies on. Well, the new tragic update to the story is that there's been a lot of flooding in one of the biggest ports in the country, which handles up to 95% of their fashion exports. And suppliers are increasingly worried about brands breaking their contracts and moving on to other suppliers. Experts in the country are estimating that it's gonna take up to six months for the Bangladesh clothing industry to fully recover. Garment factories are struggling to complete orders on time and they're worrying that Bangladeshi manufacturers may lose 10 to 15% of their business to other countries who are a bit more stable right now. Obviously, this is a heartbreaking issue and it's a direct reminder of why fashion is so broken right now. Brands aren't loyal to their suppliers. They don't have binding contracts and they don't have stakes in the company, which means they can walk away in times like this when their manufacturers are in desperate situations and need those companies more than ever. In fact, Sourcing Journal recently did a piece worrying that a lot of brands which source with Bangladesh haven't come out to specifically say they will be standing with their suppliers and not pulling orders or moving on to other hubs. Primark was actually among one of the brands that had released a statement in support of the fashion hub, but did not make clear commitments about their order levels. Let's hope fashion has more integrity than to abandon these suppliers in their time of need. Okay, on to the good news section today, which is gonna be quick, but we still have a couple of stories to cover. First, we're talking about Sojo partnering with M&S. If you don't know, Sojo is a repair service and they've directly partnered with M&S to make it easier for customers to book in a repair of their M&S clothing, which they touted as a important important step towards circular fashion, which is definitely true. Extending the lifetime of clothing is a big hurdle that would definitely improve sustainability if we were to cross it. But there's something more to this story. This story was actually suggested to me by a subscriber, shout out Juliet, for calling this out. Like Juliet says, m and have done this great partnership with Sojo, who I really admire as a company, but they're not addressing their role in fast fashion. And like I've said in in my video dedicated to supermarket companies role in fast fashion we often don't call out brands like M&S like Asda like Tesco for their massive production volumes because there's often bigger fish to fry like Shein and they're allowed to sweep under the radar you also have to think that this pledge does not include anything from M&S promising to make better quality clothing, which would probably make the need for repairs much more obsolete. Instead, the burden is placed on the consumers to pay for a repair after that clothing falls apart. And that's directly related to the quality of the materials M&S are using. The last story is a potential one, but I wanted to cover it because it could be really exciting. A new petition is seeking to end the taxation of secondhand goods in an effort to promote a more circular economy. And it has the backing of big name resale platforms like ThreadUp and Vestiaire Collective. The campaign is basically trying to argue that secondhand goods should not be taxed twice. Obviously, they've already been bought once and we shouldn't be paying a second tax when we're buying something pre-love. The petition argues that not only does it make resold items less appealing to consumers, the elimination of the tax would additionally benefit lower income families who can look to pre-loved as a very affordable and sustainable way of shopping. This is a US campaign, but it'll be interesting to see whether it passes and whether it will spread into a worldwide standard. Anyway, I'm gonna call it there. Thank you so much for watching. I'd love to hear any and all thoughts on the stories I've covered today. And just like Juliet did, if you have a story that you want me to cover, then please send it to me over social media. I'd love to hear what you guys want me to talk about and your thoughts on it too. I can feature you like I I did with Juliet. Anyway, thank you so, so much for watching and I'll speak to you really soon. Have a lovely week. Bye.